All right, welcome to season two, episode four of Mind Wars Forum. Uh, it's been a good season so far. We've got a great episode for you tonight with uh, our creative designer, Sean Slifer. I've been really uh, excited to have him on and talk to you guys and give you a real insider's view into to the designs that uh, are done at the museum, uh, what's going on with our artifacts. But before we begin, I've been promising you a segment with our director, Kenzie New Walker, and Kenzie's going to come on and do a much better job of getting you up to speed with what's going on at the museum than I do. So before we get into our discussion with Sean, I want to bring Kenzie on. And there she is. Hey, Kenzie. <laughs> hey, Chuck. Thanks for having me on. Um yeah, so June has been an extremely busy month. We uh, just had our first in-person events at the museum in mid-June where we held a donor's reception for folks who are giving to our annual fund. We had our first Solidarity Gallery Art Talk, the first of many uh, with Roger May, and he came and closed out his show then and now. Um, and also UMWA Local 1440, our nearest and dearest partner, finally got to dedicate the building that the museum is in to President Cecil Roberts. So it was a really great month and it was a really nice uh, teaser for what I think Labor Day weekend is going to feel like. Um, so today is July 1st and it's the official day that we are finalizing the schedule for the Battle of Blair Mountain Centennial. It was recently called the largest event series in the history of the state of West Virginia of its kind, uh, which is a really drastic turnaround from, you know, how people were remembering Blair Mountain, you know, 10 years ago when, when you were involved in the march and, you know, working to actually preserve the history. Um, so I encourage folks to visit Blair100.com to check out everything that's being planned. We've got film festivals, we've got symposiums, we've got concerts. Uh, UMWA will be retracing the Miners 50 Mile March. So there's really going to be something for everyone to, to join in on. And it's all across the state. I mean, there's things that are happening from Morgantown to McDowell County. Um, we also installed a new exhibit at the Solidarity Gallery. Christy Maria has a series of portraits up and they are absolutely stunning. It's the most colorful thing we've ever had in the museum and the paintings are for sale. So if you visit our website and check out the gallery or you're inside the space, um, let us know if you'd like to purchase one and, and we can make it happen. Um, I guess the final two things I'll say is we also have a scholar in residence for the first time at the museum. We were welcoming Bobby Starnes, who's a professor at Berea College, and she's spending her sabbatical with us uh, doing research in our archives, which is nice. It's a new program that we've really been building up this past year, especially while we were closed during the pandemic. And Chuck, you played a big role in that, and so did Sean, and he'll talk about it. Uh, tonight, so that will be good. And, um, but yes. oh, go go ahead. Ahead. I was gonna say, when, when you say scholar in residence, Bobby is really in residence there. She's got a <laughs> bed, uh, she's sleeping at the museum, so she's eating, breathing, and sleeping mine wars. Yes, and she's having a great time. She, um, we just got a donation of books from Ann Lawrence, who, who did the oral history on dark and bloody ground. and Bobby shared with me that her favorite find so far was a book called Helen Harlan because her father uh, worked in the mines in Harlan in the 30s when they had the mine doors there. And so she's, you know, it's really touching for her and she really enjoys being there and we love having her. My last uh, pitch, I guess I'll say, is if you're watching this, if you care about the work that the museum's doing, and I think you do if you're on here, please consider donating to the museum so we can continue to support this work. We're about $7,500 short of our annual fundraising goal. Uh, so I'll drop a link in the comments once I pop off. But that's it. All right. Thanks, Kenzie. We greatly appreciate it. Um, Kenzie's going to be taking over Mine Wars for him here in the future, in, in future seasons here. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of slide out here and allow her, her to come in and take charge. Um, 
So that's going to be so you're going to be seeing a lot more of Kenzie in the future, and uh, that's uh, always a good thing. But without further ado, let's bring on Sean. Uh, Sean, let's get you on here and go ahead and start up the conversation. What's going on, man? Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> yes, it's an overdue conversation that we need to have because I've been wanting to bring you on here, not just to talk about your book, uh, which we'll get to uh, here in a bit, but we've always talked about having a talk where we go into a little bit of detail about the design of the museum, about all the thought uh, uh, that goes into it, the process behind it. And with the new space that we have over there, I've not really, we, you know, we haven't had a chance to really articulate all the work that went into it and all the work that you did. Uh, so we're going to get into all that, but I want to um, start out all the interviews the same way, kind of a maybe mundane way to do it. But, uh, but tell me about your background, where you grew up uh, and how you got into design work and how you got into all that. Right. Okay. Well, I, I grew up in Nebraska, uh, outside of and inside of Omaha, Nebraska until I was 15. Uh, as you can see, I don't have an Appalachian accent, right? Which <laughs> sets me off the minute I, I uh, walk into Mingo County. Yeah. Um, and then we moved to Tennessee to, uh, Western Tennessee when I was a teenager, moved to middle Tennessee and went to, uh, small art and design college there in Nashville. Um, you know, I kind of, I think like a lot of kids, at least a lot of kids who grew up in the like dead middle of the country, I wanted to be a marine biologist or some kind of, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a bit like wanting to be an astronaut, you know, like I, I want to go someplace really mysterious. Um, but I was not like I went to public school. I was not really like a great student coming into junior high and high school. Always had, uh, always drew things, always was an artist kind of on the side. So when it came time to figure out if I was going to go to college, what I was going to do, when I got out of high school, I worked for about a year and then I ended up uh, moving to Nashville and, and originally as a graphic design student. And the school there is very wrapped into the the music industry actually so i saw this really kind of odd side of like what graphic design is within the industry and that kind of pushed me towards more um more creative work instead kind of just like sort of locking myself into being a studio mm -hmm. artist but at the same time i was an activist right like i was a student activist and uh i got into history not through studying it in school but through trying to figure out what the basis for and the history uh was of the kind of work that i was doing uh you know in the in the early 2000s with my friends um we were doing a lot of work with the homeless for example in nashville and so like a lot of people i read howard zinn's people's mm -hmm. history of the united states and i was reading some noam chomsky and some other kind of like sort of stalwart um historians and uh and just kind of took a deep dive into history um sort of through the back door so I moved to Pittsburgh about 16 years ago. I've lived in the Bloomfield neighborhood of Pittsburgh ever since then, um, which I consider to be an Appalachian city. Mm -hmm. Some people might <laughs> might argue against that, but um, uh, so I've been in Pittsburgh and kind of focused on the same things ever since. Yeah, I, I very much consider Pittsburgh an Appalachian city, and it has a lot of the same trends that, that uh, a lot of the rest of Appalachia. When I taught a uh, Penn State, the, the one of their off campuses in Uniontown, which is in between, of course, Pittsburgh and Morgantown. I will, yeah. I would tell them that they're Appalachians, and at first they didn't like it uh, when I would call them that. But then <laughs> after I would explain things to them, they're like, "Oh, I guess we kind of are." Uh, and yeah. I was like, "Because there's not much difference in the kids in Uniontown and the kids in Logan County, really not uh, accents." Uh, yeah, the accents the main thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. What got you involved with the museum? Uh, you met some shady character by the name of Lou Martin, I believe, uh, somewhere <laughs> along the way. Uh, so, well, Lou Martin you? accosted me in an alleyway late at night in Pittsburgh and dragged me into a van and said, yeah. we need somebody to... No, I... I so it is a funny <laughs> story. I really... Um, uh, before I met Lou, I was good friends with Katie Lauer, who's another founding board member. 
uh, and one of the organizers of the the March on Blair Mountain in 2011. So mm -hmm. I had, um, despite sort of having stepped back from going to protests in, in urban environments, had never been to a protest that was five days long in, the, in a rural area. And I went to that March on Blair Mountain and, and met a lot of people there and kind of a few years after that, Katie emailed me and said, you know, we're working on this museum, kind of just sent me this, this fundraising pitch, really. But I think she knew that I would say, can I be more involved? And so originally, I just kind of said, I will totally volunteer some graphic design. But I also, for years, um, earned just an hourly wage as a, a exhibit installer at various museums here in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, which right. basically involves everything from unloading trucks to moving artifacts around in, in exhibits and then disappearing before it opens to the public. So I had also said to her, you know, I could drywall, I could kind of just, you know, whatever sort of skills you guys need. But, um, you know, early on, I came down to the meetings and I met this really dynamic, amazing group of people who had figured almost everything out except what would happen right when people walked in the door of the museum. And then that was where I came in. So I really sort of got sucked in. It was like, oh, well, that's kind of what I do. But usually I'm not given uh, as much uh, range to, to design that kind of stuff. So all of a sudden I was neck deep in designing exhibits at our original space. Yeah. And that first space, you know, it, it had its challenges, you know, <laughs> from the narrative standpoint, from the spatial standpoint. We didn't have a ton From of room. a humidity standpoint. Yes. <laughs> yes. Don't even want to talk about the humidity that, uh, <laughs> that we had to go through. But yeah, the, the, the there wasn't space for, first of all, to tell the story adequately. We also really didn't have the artifacts to tell the story adequately either. You know, we, we, we had scattered things here and there. And I want to get back to that in a moment because uh, I, I want to bring up boots on the ground here in a minute. Mm hmm. Uh, and, and talk a little bit about that. But, you know, it presented its own unique list of challenges that, that you had to do in, in that first space. And I remember being there with you in the, in the two weeks before, you know, <laughs> when we were opening it up and, you know, glass cases going up and little paint jobs uh, here and there. And then we move, we move across. And what are the different, what's the difference in the challenge of the first space with the new space now that people are coming and seeing? I mean, there was a couple things, right? Like, I think one of the things that that comes to mind first was that in 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 our initial opening, I I remember feeling like I don't know how long this is going to last. I don't know that we're going to have this space very long. I'm not really sure how structurally sound the floor is. You know, it was really just felt like we really had a really nice video projector that broke like two months into. Uh, you know, at the time that we were open, I just remember feeling this kind of consistent instability. And, um, but, you know, we were going for it. We were doing it. I mean, after we were there for two or three years, it, you know, we were still there, right? And we were building an education program and, and um, you know, starting membership programs and stuff. People were really supporting us. So, you know, moving in, first of all, to move into the new building that the union owns and runs was like, you know, meshing better with the union local, moving into a building that was structurally very stable, that we could rebuild after five years of experience of kind of what we would want to do in a new space. Um, and I think we also just got an opportunity to, to redesign uh, in a little bit more of a... Uh, in a kind of collective way with the board you know, some of those exercises we were doing. I did these exercises where I, I had a floor plan of the entire bank that we moved into, which you know, was a, had mm -hmm. been the bb &T. and And then I just, you know, we just sat down with these blank floor plans and everybody kind of drew where they thought the walls should be and where we thought the narrative would be and, and, you know, walked people through those exercises. And that was really, I think, one of the biggest changes was was going through that process with everybody on the board and trying to figure out priorities. You know, that's where our... our the Solidarity Gallery came from was just people kind of were drawing th this room in almost all the drawings. There was this other room where we would do something, you know, kind of really? undefined, yeah. right? And so that became a gallery and potentially, you know, future history exhibits as well. So um, it was an amazing opportunity to just kind of come back together and say, like, what have we learned in the last five years and what do we want to do now? Yeah. yeah. And there's no humidity problem 
right. at all. <laughs> like, the right. electrical, top-notch electrical, everything works when you plug it in. So that feels good too. Yeah, it does. I remember our, our lighting issues in the in the first year too it was bulb going out here and there and yeah, a lot of bulbs. Uh, uh, <laughs> issues sometimes with one of the screens. Uh, yeah. So we, we were able to get all of those bugs out of the way. From a stylistic standpoint, though, one of the things that, and let me go back to this, the boots on the ground exhibit. Mm -hmm. I see that as almost like a bridge between the first museum and the second and the second museum. So for those that, that aren't familiar that are watching, and it also gives us a good, a good chance to, to, to talk about the ext extemporaneous way in which we sometimes put things together because we get this, uh, we get a call from Doug Step, who Doug, uh, Doug Step is one of our major donors. He always gets amazing stuff for us. Get a call from Doug Step. Hey, I've got a chest full of HH Band Pulse's personal items, right? So we've got this chest. So he sends us this chest that's got all this stuff, a pair of dirty socks that we uh, pass around. <laughs> uh, Army general dirty socks is what they <laughs> Yes. Yes, so which are still there, still with us. We still have the socks. <laughs> so we uh, we got this chest, and we're like, okay, what do we do with it? And then we were able to throw together some postcard pictures for that Kenny King acquired, and do this uh, little exhibit on federal intervention. Mm -hmm. But I noticed a number of things that you did with that uh, little exhibit that would carry on uh, a spill over into the new space audio uh the audio boxes the uh the idea of just putting different color uh right. on, on the walls the font uh <laughs> the, the, that we found so tell me about uh did that exhibit and it was only up for uh one season right I mean, right it up in may and then it was gone in october uh, but uh, it's one of my more. Uh, it's one of the more satisfying little projects that that we were able to do, just because we we put it together so swiftly. We got a little grant from Jasmer Foundation. Mm -hmm. So, can can you talk to me about how some of that uh, worked into your thinking of what the look, the stylistic look of the new space? Yeah. So, I mean, I think you're right. That was really a bridge. Um, it, in the rest of the museum at that time, I had done what, what I had learned to do in, in uh, a lot of the art spaces that I'd worked in, which is where mm -hmm. you, you sort of come into a place and you clean it out and you create this, you know, you almost kind of sterilize the space. But in Matewan, it was a little bit more community based than that, but we had painted everything gray, remember? And, it, and just mm -hmm. sort of like everything was gray and this allowed the objects to kind of stand on their own and the photos to kind of stand on their own. But I think for one, that just started to feel a little bit boring. And then we had this opportunity with this with this army general stuff to to talk about the army. And I was like, you know, God, I really want to just paint it army green, right? Like I just kind of want to go all the way there. I kind of want to find a a nice sort of G.I. Joe P green color mm -hmm. and you know, make the lettering yellow. And uh, but we were working with a really small space too. So we had to kind of start stag we had a lot of photos, but we didn't, you know, we had to kind of end up staggering them on the wall. Uh, we got that John Lewis painting mm -hmm. in at the same time, yeah. which we wanted yeah. to also fit in. And the, after the conservator cleaned it for us, you're like, God, I've got to fit this thing in the wall too. And I think it just broke up the um, the general uh, line that that I had drawn in the original space, and 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 made me start thinking about like, well, people don't really care if all the photos are in the same place, right? And and then in moving to the new space, we tell our story in several steps. Right. Like we start with telling people what coal camp life was like, and then we move into Paint Creek, Cabin Creek, and then we move into a Battle of Mate One and whatnot. And I just started thinking, well, each of these could have a distinct color, right? Like you walk into the space and the, and the color of the wall sort of begins to set the tone, right? So in the new space, you walk into coal camp life and it's a very dark wall. It's not like you're really in a coal mine, but maybe it kind of makes you think a little bit about the darkness of a mine. Mm -hmm. um and so i think i t and you know also in my i've painted so many walls white in in my jobs that now mm -hmm. you, if you come to my house there are no white walls anywhere right. <laughs> okay. going. and i think what did we land on like nine i think there are nine different wall colors in the new museum 
for every step that you walk through of the stories that we tell. And, uh, and it turned, you know, the old bank into, I think, like a really colorful space as a result. I mean, I think with a lot of design, like the thing is that people don't always consciously register that, but they unconsciously take it in. Right. And so those color shifts per story, we tell a compressed story, right? Like we have mm -hmm. World War I in like kind of almost a hallway. So you got to figure out how to break people out of, out of and into those steps. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it works great. It's one of my favorite things about the new space is how we walk in and go through these different spaces and uh, the, the different colors, uh, that color at the end that I like that I was that purplish kind of maroonish, you know, whatever color that is. Yeah. I just remember putting multiple, we was putting multiple coats of paint on that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That took a lot of coats on that one. Yeah. Yeah. But, but uh, so aside from that, I think about our artifacts and the, the like, like with the band holds thing and that it's one of those, we have to kind of part of part of the thing that dictates the story that we tell are the artifacts that we have. And so we have to find ways to take those artifacts. You know, it would be great if, you know, if we had original bandanas or, or, you know, mother Jones's purse or something like that, but we don't have a lot of that stuff. Right. So we have to try to get creative. And I think one of the more creative things that, that, that I've seen you do when we were dealing with check tags, remember the first space, basically all we have tons, we have hundreds and hundreds of check tags. It's like script, right? Everybody wants to give us check tags. Everybody wants to give a script whenever they come and visit us. So uh, the first space, we just have them basically in a display case that's on the floor, kind of spread out and a little ax, uh, a little pickaxe, pickaxe in the case, yeah. that, uh, in the case. And th that quote by Kenny about every one of them being a man, but uh, people would, and, and I noticed that when I saw the museum, watching people I always try to watch people whenever they're going to the space to see what they're paying attention to, what mm -hmm. they're not. People would, you know, look down and then, you know, just kind of move on. They wouldn't really do anything with it. So how do we take those check tags and make them something interesting, make them something that resonates? So what did we do in the new space that, that, that does that? Yeah, I, <laughs> that's a good example because I remember, you know, originally, yeah, kind of dumping them in that case on the floor. I was, I was, you know, thinking about them as a multitude of people, right? Like that each man had their own, each miner had their own number and that number was on a tag and sort of just like disseminating them in this square case. And then as you're saying, it just really didn't track, right? Like people just sort of walked right past it. Right. And then in the new space, I remember thinking there's a couple of objects that we just have in, in incredible multitude, right? Like certain certain calibers of, of ammunition shell and, mm -hmm. and these check tags. And I think I counted 460 check tags that we had got from Kenny King. And, um, you know, they didn't have anything specific about them where they needed to be put on their own, right? Like they were just sort of these anonymous check tags and, and you and I talking about how can we take, take that multitude and make, make a number mean something, you know, make the, each one of them represents a man become something that, that would mm -hmm. punch you in the gut a little bit more. And you brought up the, the Monongah uh, explosion or disaster and is it 1908 or 19, 1907. 1907. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And so, and we put the, you know, 361, right? 361 mm -hmm. check tags on the wall, one for each person that died in that explosion. And this is how now, this is how people enter into the life in the coal camps exhibit is you're, you're presented really on both walls on, on one wall is, is a map of, of the Southern West Virginia coal fields in every, every coal town. Mm -hmm. And people love to, to find the places where their family lived or where they grew up. And facing that is that, that memorial really, you walk into a memorial as the very first thing mm -hmm. uh, to set the tone for walking into what it was like to live in the coal camps. And, I do tend to like as the person who's working with those things, I do sit like with it kind of emotionally while I'm doing it, but I'm also performing a task, right? Like I'm like hammering them mm -hmm. on the wall, like individually. I mean, it just like took hours to get them on yes. there. And, and I think it, and then I move on to the next thing. Right. So I haven't had sometimes a lot of time to reflect on like how much of a gut punch that really is, but I definitely see other people respond to it that way. Um, yeah. And again, it's a unique way to take, something that we have a lot of and make it something that resonates. 
And, you know, we had this wonderful Miners Memorial exhibit uh, mm -hmm. that was designed a few years ago. And But that's a traveling exhibit, so it's, it's moving around from place to place. So we don't have that in-house. And then the check tags and the memorial to the Bonanga Blast kind of fills that gap. And it also, again, one of the things that we try to do from a narrative standpoint is explain why the, why why they were wars. Why were there mine wars? Well, right. 361 people at least that die in a, in a blast. Okay, that, that that begins to set the tone for what's to come. Yeah. So I, I think it's really uh, really valuable. Uh, what are the other? Uh, you know, you do also also we do a lot of replicas. In, mm -hmm. uh, in the space. Uh, one of the favorite ones is, is the bomb replica. How did that come to pass? <laughs> so the bomb, um, so this is a replica of one of two types of bombs that, that uh, the King Cole Army or, or Don Chafin's defenders during the Battle of Blair Mountain that they threw from private airplanes uh, onto the, the miners' army. And, and we... I mean, to my knowledge, there's one photograph of what one of those bombs look like, and it's the one that ran in the Charleston Gazette, where they're they're sort of holding it in front of a like a mm -hmm. like a white canvas or something, so you can kind of see the outline, and and very little other information, a little bit of of you know details here and there, and in, in reports from the field. But um, you know, I, my friend Ben Grubb is a is a welder and a and a metal artist here in Pittsburgh, and so I actually asked him, you know, do you think you could showed him the picture and told him about the time period and said like, what well, could you make this and how would they have joined these things together and what are these things? And he said, oh, you know, well, this is just like standard iron sewage pipe from the time, right? And he actually <laughs> um, lives in a neighborhood next to me, Polish Hill, and had just, uh, this is a couple of years ago, had dug out a uh, an outhouse behind his neighbor's house that was plumbed and pulled a bunch of that exact iron pipe out of the ground. And so he cleaned it off and built the replica out of pipe that was originally from that era. And I got to say, when he gave it to me, I mean, you know, it is a replica, but it's also, it's not like it's made out of plastic. It's the actual mm -hmm. thing and it's really, really heavy. So it's hard to imagine kind of heaving this thing out the side of a biplane, <laughs> uh, you know, but in, mm -hmm. in, in reality, that's what it was. So it's a, it's a, it's a, brutal looking thing. I mean, if you didn't know what it was, you'd just think we had kind of a weird piece of black pipe on a, on a pedestal in the, in the, in the museum, but we have it exhibited along with some of the transcripts, mm -hmm. um, you know, field reporting to, to Colonel Eubanks during the battle of Blair mountain that actually mentions the type of explosives that they were throwing from the plane. So it puts that into a bit of context. Mm -hmm. And I've seen people standing in front of it, kind of ignoring it, reading those those transcripts which are very dry um <laughs> right. and, and then going wait they dropped bombs on these people it's like yeah you know we actually get to show that yeah for the first time and of course you know so you're right it, it's it's not the real bomb <laughs> to my knowledge there aren't any bombs right. i had to drive with this thing down to pittsburgh so i was even a little bit afraid of like i gotta mm -hmm. drive seven hours with a pipe bomb in my truck <laughs> this museum <laughs> you know like i hope that's i hope i don't get pulled over with this thing um, yeah, man. yeah, that would be unfortunate. Yeah, that would have sucked. Yeah, <laughs> but by the way, you mentioned though that he found it uh, while in digging up an outhouse, yeah, uh, a plumbed outhouse. Yeah, in in Pittsburgh. Uh huh. Okay, so so Pittsburgh can no longer lay claim to not being an Appalachian city. If you're <laughs> the outhouses, come on now. That's yeah. Full on, that's full on Appalachian. Revealed. Revealed. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> we found your outhouse roots, Pittsburgh. Uh, so <laughs> you never know what kind of nugget we're going to find here on Mon Wars Forum, you know. Absolutely, yeah. A bit of discovery here. <laughs> so uh, we, we could um, we could go through the whole museum and probably talk for the next hour and a half about uh, all the little different things and the, and the decisions that were made uh, going back and forth. There, there's so many things, little things that I hope people notice. And one of the things that I've heard from people that have been to the museum, the new space, and many of them have told me, in fact, all of them have told me that they want to go back 
because there were things that they didn't get to see the first time or thoroughly look at the first time. And it's always a good feeling when people go to your space, look through it, and they're thinking, well, I've got to go back and, and see it with more depth. So yeah, absolutely. Can, it's like, like, you know, when someone gets right back on a roller coaster to do it a second time, they're like, well, the good first time was pretty good then, I guess. Yeah, yeah. it's a good feeling for sure. What's your favorite thing about the new space? Do you have a favorite spot or something that, from the, the, that you are most proud of or? You know, it's a couple of things. I think like as a designer, I get really into things like lighting. Like I'm very happy with the, 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 the lighting, the lighting's dim in spots mm -hmm. and I'm very happy with it. Right, but that's the stuff nobody notices. Uh, I really like what we were able to do with the tent. You know, we have this, this replica tent that's one of the smaller types they would have had in the era that that you can actually walk into and, and sit in um like a family might have lived in during mm -hmm. during a strike and in the original space we actually kind of had to build around that tent and it was always kind of squared into a corner and you know people loved it but it was it it felt um it never felt like it got its due and so i was able to uh make it much more theatrical in in this space and and you know kind of like put it in a tight corner and painted that very dark and there's this kind of mountain dusk setting in the background yeah. these like purples and stuff and there's there's a recording of some crickets and peepers it's playing very quietly in the background and i just love the it, you know you can you like i was sort of walking a line where it's getting into haunted house territory but it was just really really fun to to do that and kind of, you know, again, allow people like a space to kind of step mm -hmm. out of out of a museum and into something that was a bit interactive and just be in that tent for a minute in the night. Create, creating that atmosphere is important, though. I, you know, I just came to I was in Chicago all week and went to the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. Of course, they have all kinds of uh, dinosaur bones and reconstructed replicas and all this kind of stuff. They have a big T-Rex exhibit. <laughs> anyway, and, you're, and as you're walking through toward down all down this, these hallways to, to the big rooms that, that have the, you know, the reconstructed uh, dinosaur, the plaster reconstructions of the dinosaur bones, uh, anyway, you go through it and they have the same kind of thing that they try to give you these these paintings and stuff that makes it you feel like you're back in the in the Jurassic, you know, with the <laughs> vegetation and you hear they've, they've got sounds. They even have a, had a like a, 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 a kind of like a mist machine. <laughs> here. Yeah, and we should get one of those. Yes, we need a mist machine uh, <laughs> over there so they can like feel the more. But but this thing, it does add to the atmosphere. It does help yeah. uh, get you a little bit in the mood psychologically for what you're going to see. So I, I think it's terrific. And I remember the early days of you painting all the, the different um, hillsides behind it, you know, to give it that kind of a dusk uh, look to it. I think this is what, set, you know, this is like what makes it an experience beyond just feeling like you're coming in and reading a book that is a room. You know what I mean? Because we also have a lot of stuff people can read. There's a lot of like very specific information. If you were to go through and visit every single item and read all the labels and read the timelines mm -hmm. that you wrote, I mean, there's a lot to take in, right? Which I, I love to see people read that. And I think you, you have to make that balance, right? If people come mm -hmm. to learn about dinosaurs, you also, you know, you could put that T-Rex in a big white room and it would be pretty fantastic. But if you if you set it in a, in a moodier environment, it's actually more fun. I think yeah. it's more fun to just be there. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and, and that's part of it. Okay. Well, get, getting beyond the museum design, there's okay. been, uh, we're, we're doing constant work. One of the things uh, with the new space, we've got extra rooms. We've got rooms, uh, better rooms to store our stuff. Our original space, uh, our storage was probably a little less than stellar. Yeah, what storage? Uh, uh, <laughs> if uh, that's the best way I can put it, put yeah. it the uh, most polite way I can put it. You know, it reminded me of my my dorm room, uh, freshman year, uh, mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways. So uh, we have all these artifacts, and so a lot of the a lot of which that are not on display, right? And yeah, so yeah, yeah. How are we going to store them? And when we were dealing with 
mildew and, and mold and all, all that kind of stuff in the old space. We now had a controlled atmosphere that we can bring things in. We have a better way of cataloging them. We wanted to put them in as a catalog. And we also are, are beginning the, the creations of a library and archive that we're going to create. And the mm -hmm. purpose here is, of course, to make this destination not just a place where people can go see exhibits, but where people can do research. We want to be ground zero for mine wars research, not just wow. and knowledge and, and collecting all the things that we can collect that are around that. So you've done a ton of work with this, with the archives uh, over the last uh, few months. Of course, we brought Roger May in to, to photograph them all, take pictures of them all. And we, you know, we had, we had a lot of fun uh, doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of hard. It was a lot of stuff I didn't even remember that we had. Right. Honestly, when we started pulling it all out. Yeah. 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 Uh, so talk to me a little bit about that process uh, and what you've been doing since. I believe you have some show and tell for us here. Um, I have some yeah. objects. Yeah. Um, I'm working on another cataloging project right now. Um, yeah. I mean, like you said, it. I mean, honestly, boy, we opened on Labor Day and then I just transitioned right into the cataloging work with a very short break. Um, you know, it was right back down in Mate One doing the initial photography work with with you and Kenzie and Roger, and and then I did most of the cataloging work remotely, which was just like I mean, some of the stuff I didn't even hardly know what it was, and um, and and with an aim towards creating online exhibitions, which which could be pretty boring, you know, if you're not careful, but they're very different than how we show things in the museum. Everything is is lit in a very particular way, and it's it's um, a bit more research based. Uh, but I'm really proud of it. And I'm really, it's been amazing to see Bobby Starnes in there, like already using the research room that we created with the computer and the place where you can look at the artifacts. Like, okay, you know, we're yeah. already getting in that next space. Um, right now I'm doing a, uh, a project with some of the archeology span digs from Blair Mountain that happened in 2006 and 2009, which, as you know, were instrumental in, in kind of helping frame some of the, the protection efforts for the mountain and right. defining like some of the story of like where troops were actually moving around. So most of what I have is a lot of 30 out six shells like this. I mean, like a bunch of Ziploc bags of these guys. I'm not photographing them all individually, but um, I have figured out a system um, and, and a majority of what we have is honestly is ammunition. So it's, mm. it's, you know, I'm not a, I'm learning as I'm doing this. The reason we have a lot of ammunition is in part because most of this was dug out of the ground. Um, this is your favorite Chuck. I think this is actually a cannonball, mm. like a real life cannonball. I don't know what else it would be. It could be a meteorite, but we're pretty damn sure it's a cannonball. It's quite heavy. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And so, you know, and we do have photos of the cannon that this probably came from. So um, I'm kind of having a blast figuring out it, just being with these objects and, and thinking about mm -hmm. how somebody had to pull these out of the ground in order to, you know, make a bridge between the oral histories and the academic histories that, that were out there about the mine wars to actually pull real things in and say, like, look, this this is a this is guerrilla warfare that happened in the middle of southern West Virginia. Right. Like this is example of that yeah and about that cannibal one of the reasons why it's one of my favorite things uh or my, one of my favorite new things is <laughs> you know what we've seen you know that there was this cannon you know that belonged to bill blizzard and then bill blizzard jr and that was claimed to be used on blair mountain or whatever but i've never seen any evidence you right. know of that actually happening and you were going through the stuff when was it when we were this was just a couple of weeks ago when yeah. we were looking through it all yeah 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 and it was this a cannonball and and sure enough yeah and that's direct evidence mm -hmm. i don't know of any civil war things that were going on and there was a little battle at chapmanville but i don't know of anything near there that, that would have been civil war era or, or that would have been connected with so that's actually evidence that yes Apparently, miners were used taking a cannon and trying to fire up at the machine gun entrenchments. It also, I've uh, been contacted by somebody else in Blair, in the Blair area, who they found a cannonball up there. And I'm supposed to be talking with them about it soon. <laughs> these are the kind, of, for everybody else, these are the kind of things Chuck and I text about. It's like, 
<laughs> talks to my friend that I get a text. I think I found another cannonball. Yeah. Are you on Blair right now? No, but this guy called me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. You know, it's a <laughs> no, no, that's our late night weekend text. That's our museum <laughs> life right now. Yeah, yeah. You up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about ammunition. Uh, but, but, uh, but yeah. Um, but, but it also shows again, up top, they had machine guns down at the bottom. They're trying to use civil war era cannons. Mm -hmm. So yeah. and it, hunting it, helps, rifles. It, it does help tell the story of what the miners were up against and what they had to use to try to break the lines of player. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and so I think it's a balance dealing with the ammunition, right? Like it's really easy to kind of just go way over into a realm where you're talking almost purely about the guns. And I think, I hope we do a good job of balancing that out. Right. Because on the one hand, it really was a war. Right. But it wasn't entirely like, it's not the only thing we want people to think about. We want to lead them in and out of that, that specific event and mm -hmm. talk about all the other, all the other mm -hmm. pieces of it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and Lou and Kat have always been adamant, you know, we're more than just bullets and guns. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. uh, but again, we have a lot of bullets, so we, we have. have to find, <laughs> so we have to find creative ways to use that to try to tell a story that's that's much larger than that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other? Um, I, I, the, the only one I stuck on my desk that I think is amazing. This is a piece of a tree. Kenny had to explain why this was in a bag to me, but it actually has a bullet lodged inside it. Oh, okay. so it is a little bit heavy, but I said, you know, well, what's with the, is this like a piece of a fence post or something? He was like, oh, no, no, you know, we pulled that out of a fallen tree and that actually has a bullet inside it. There's also a shoe, but to be honest, I'm a little bit afraid to take it out of the bag right now. So I didn't, <laughs> didn't know if I should, there will be a great picture of the shoe online once I finally carefully pull it out of the bag, but I didn't want to destroy it tonight. It's very fragile. Yeah. It's kind of amazing that it survived. You know, is it a, is it a children's shoe or is it an uh, is it an adult shoe? It seems like an adult shoe. I mean, it looks a bit like a like a like a wingtip or something. You know, it's kind of hard to it's kind of yeah. hard to understand exactly what it was, but um, but it is an adult shoe. It's got those little tiny infant shoes, like those little knitted things that that uh, in our glass case, and then of course we have Bandholtz's boots, which are unbelievable. Oh, <laughs> The, yeah, those are not the most like U.S. Army general kind of boots. They're a little bit small. They're small boots. They're very small boots. Yeah. You think about the strong arm of the federal government. That's, that's, that's we should have called it tiny boots on the ground. His yeah, well, his riding boots were very you know, <laughs> trim. Those are the boots, by the way. That just so everyone know, we were talking about the socks earlier. Chuck and I were actually, you know, we're opening this 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 trunk, this officer's trunk, and. And when we were first looking at the boots, I reached inside just to see, and I pulled, you know, a sock out of each one. <laughs> and then I ended up hanging them on the laundry line where we had, we have a laundry line in the coal camp life exhibit with a couple of reproduction yeah. uh, pieces of clothing. <laughs> so I just kind of hung them on there last minute because I, well, you know, they, it's a good pair of socks. It's a hundred year old pair of socks. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, I guess they, they I'm probably breaking them. some like textile conservation rules by doing that. So I'm also exposing some of the lines that we do cross uh, with how we deal with artifacts in the museum, which I think is interesting, right? Because we, I was taught, I won't go on a tangent about this, but I was always taught to like be very careful with these. Most of the artifacts I handled in my jobs at museums belong to other people and in mm -hmm. fact belong to investors or collectors. And this kind of things that we tell stories within the museum really just belong to the people in the community or members of the community who have found them or bought them mm -hmm. on, on eBay in order to present them to the community. So the way in which these objects move through people's hands and are active parts of the stories that we tell is, is, is very different than that kind of conservation approach. The, you know, the artifacts are conserved through sharing them and through passing them around and people actually holding them. Yeah. Uh, which I think is really beautiful. It's very, very different way to kind of interact with that history. I think than a lot of museums would right. present, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Our uh, lack of formal training or at least my lack of formal training in museum work is kind of free. It, and then one hand it's kind of freed us up. And on the other hand, it's we, we don't necessarily always do things as by the book as perhaps we should. 
It allows us some interesting flexibility, right? I, I think, yeah. like, I, you know, I've been trying to use gloves more when I'm handling artifacts just as a matter of, mm -hmm. of protocol and to kind of actually really set the stage for what re researchers do when we're there. But at the same time, like when researchers come, we will want them to experience those objects, right? We do have some mm -hmm. things locked under plexiglass, mo mostly as a security issue because the people whose objects they are asked us to do that. But otherwise, you know, there's still some things you can touch you mm -hmm. can pick that baton up off the wall. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that really helps people connect, especially. Yeah. And, and you can touch those tiny boots. They're, 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 you they're can there. touch those boots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are there. not last as long as a result of that, but you can touch those boots. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. so we're excited about all that. You know, it's the, the museum has grown in so many different ways, kind of organically from its original spot to where we are now. And we're finally kind of at a, at, at a place where we're, we're establishing ourselves as fully much more as a functioning museum, archive, collection. And that's really satisfying to see. And you've done so you've been indispensable to all of that. But I do, uh, you know, I've talked with the other board members and we really need to discuss your anger management issues here. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, I had to get that out somehow. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> so here's the book. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that's kind of the irony of the title because you're one of the nicest people uh, that I know. <laughs> you, you never, uh, I've never seen you really, I've never seen you really angry. I've seen you frustrated <laughs> maybe a time or two when we were, were putting some things together, but I've never really sure. seen you mad. Right. Yeah. I mean, you've always nice. You're always concerned about everybody's feelings. You know, you don't want to hurt people's feelings. You're uh, you're always really conscientious of that and uh, <laughs> always considerate and kind. And then your book is titled So Much to be Angry About. Yeah. Well, you know what? It, it's there's a, one of the Avengers movies where the Hulk is like, well, you know, my secret is that I'm always angry. You know, and So <laughs> my baseline is angry. And then everything you see from there is, you know, kind of sugar on top, maybe. Yeah. But um, yeah, serenity now. Serenity. <laughs> right. You want me to talk about the book a bit? Yes. Yes. So where did this come from? You know, you've got uh, the Appalachian Movement Press, and uh, I, I don't want to ask the same boring questions that you probably usually get asked when you get interviewed. I've, I've been through that, some of that myself. Where did the book come from? Where did you, you know, you've explained Why? that in the book, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, where, where the book came from. But you're really passionate about this, uh, the, it's preservation work in many ways, what you're doing here. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're preserving uh, the part the, the, that this press came, you know, they're, they're part of this new left, you know, movement uh, press. The, you know, the, there were a bunch of these all over the country. Many of them fizzled out after a few years. Why is Appalachian Movement Press significant? I mean, I think that, yeah, so underpinning, I think, somehow or another, almost all the work I do and have been doing for years creatively is digging up stories that that maybe aren't that widely known and, and sort of smashing up stereotypes and challenging, you know, a kind of dominant paradigm about an area. And so, you know... It, being in left movement, you know, for most of my adult life, I kind of, I was familiar with movement presses, but they've always, the ones that I've learned about were always in like cool cities, you know, or they were in New York or they were in the Bay or something, you know, places that were already known for being sort of hubs of cultural production at one time or another, if not mm -hmm. still. And when I learned about Appalachian movement press, I was like, man, they were in Huntington, you know, right? Like the, here were some folks in Huntington, West Virginia, in the 1970s who were doing exactly the same thing for their communities that people were doing in other parts of of uh of the united states and like i gotta figure that out right i gotta i just i gotta figure out what these people were doing and i you know i i think i brought some i have some of the pamphlets here i i think like i also grew up with uh with zines and and like sort of self-publishing mm -hmm. stuff so this kind of stuff was like really familiar to me that that in in activist movement we would be creating our own our own uh, tools and our own literature in a way or at least right. some alternative literature so i just kind of caught the um 
the bug kind of caught the history bug or the, the, yeah. the disease as it were. And I just started running with this thing. And I think, you know, at least for the people in Appalachian movement press, and I think this is true in a lot of cases, they were producing publications as a means to an end, not to be people who produced publications in and of themselves. Right. So like authorship wasn't really that important to them. And therefore like, the archiving of those things wasn't that important to them and all this stuff is kind of created and then filtered away mm -hmm. so to turn this stuff into a book hopefully has a couple of effects beyond being really fun i hope for people to read right like is that people inside appalachia will hopefully learn about things that that they didn't know about that bring or further a sense of pride you know like man that's awesome like because mm -hmm. what they were doing was awesome and then also from people outside the region that they might think, wow, you know, um, I didn't, for example, know that there had that there had been or is an active left in southern West Virginia mm -hmm. or in Appalachia generally. So it can break up the stereotype that way, too. And in a number of ways, they were doing some of the things that we do in the sense that they were preserving, you know, they, they were trying to keep in mind Ward's history alive. Mm -hmm. uh, they were reprinting stuff, you know, like Corbin's work mm -hmm. on the Socialist and Labor Star. They they were hearkening back to earlier, you know, uh, stuff that was happening a generation earlier, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the Labor Star in Huntington, reviving some of that. They also had some great stuff, uh, reprinting stuff from mm -hmm. Labor Age, you know, about the West Virginia Mine Workers Union and all of the internal labor turmoil that was taking place in the early 30s. And they were keeping some of that stuff alive that way by reprinting some old articles exactly. or digging up some old stuff. So in a lot of ways, they're, they were doing some of the things, at least in the same spirit that, that, that we're doing, is trying to reinsert. I, shoot, I had a couple of things underlined that really impressed me and I can't enough. While you're the, looking, I'll just tell people this is where the title came from, just so they don't think I'm totally angry all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. well, you're looking for your questions. Because Don West, who's who's pretty revered in certain circles in Appalachia, was was, you know, kind of a central uh and significantly older member mm -hmm. of, of the circle around Appalachian movement press. And so this was this was the first of theirs the publications that I saw and I, you know, when it was handed to me, I was like a time for anger that could be any time. Um, and it's full of <laughs> poems and right. it's a poetry chat book. And I had the, it looked like it had been published before I was born, which it actually had been, even though the, f the form is exactly the same as the kind of publications that I started making in my teens and early twenties. And I can't find it. Shoot. It was a good quote. I had it, I underlined it earlier this afternoon when I was riding down from Chicago and then in the rush to get up here and get set up right before the show started, I lost the place. Do you remember the, the, the context of it was they were saying something similar that, that I, that I talk about the identity reclamation where they're trying oh. to reclaim a lost history or reclaim an identity. And they were the sure. first ones to really talk a lot about identity. Um, I, I, I grow weary of talking about identity at times. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've published on it myself, but it, it's it, it's good that they were the, they were looking at that. And by the way, I'm going to give you props too for you. You do a good job of breaking down the that they were heavily influenced by the internal colonial theory uh, in the 70s. The, and and you mentioned, of course, now that a lot of scholars go to the world capitalist system mode of analysis when they're trying to talk about Appalachia. But you do a good job of placing that in that context of the new left, the early ideas of looking at Appalachia as a colony and where they were looking at it from that. But also the fact that they they, they still had some, some issues with uh, gender equality. They still had, it, this isn't just a romanticization of what they did, that you're actually putting it into the context of the times and you're 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 looking at also at some of the things that maybe they could have improved upon without damning them i think right. you know is the really important thing right like it's really just i i saw you know even in some of the conversations i had with the people i interviewed you know i saw some big flaws here and there and i saw things that you know maybe i wish had been different but i can tell you i didn't see anything that was drastically different than any movement organization that i've been a part of in my life right like yeah. we, we, you know we're, we're 
struggling and growing, right? And are also kind of a product of our time. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I'm glad that you like that chapter because like literally nobody asked me to write a chapter that involved and talked about theory or colonization or anything, but I needed to figure out how to frame that. And I felt like it was important to frame the time that they were in. These were people, you know, they were centered in Huntington, but they had an internationalist perspective. They were very aware of what was happening around the world and what other kinds of identity movements, mm -hmm. you know, what, what those movements were doing. They saw themselves as like building, building that up here, like that kind of identity reclamation. And then like, you know, stepping into struggle with other, other organizations, right? Yeah. And so, you know, but there's going to be flaws and I think it can be really easy sometimes to just look back at how something before our time or maybe even 10 or 15 years ago didn't work or could have been better or use language that we find that, that we would have friction with now and just kind of dismiss it. And, and I don't think we learned from that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, people are flawed, people grow, people change. And as you said, they're products of their time. And uh, when you have organizations like that and people aren't getting paid a lot or not getting paid at all, volunteering <laughs> and they're idealistic, you're going to have personality clashes. You're going to have uh, friction uh, from time <laughs> to time, <laughs> and, uh, the, the, yeah. to, to put it mildly. So uh, lots of good reprints and some of the other efforts that they were doing, like the, the efforts to really uh, – portrayed the, the mountain South as being anti-Confederate and anti-slavery. Uh -huh. Like that, that's in one of the reprints. That's really interesting to, by taking individual examples of individuals, you know, that they, that he found that that's a really interesting, they're, they're trying to, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a major stretch. He's really, really stretching things, but, uh, but yeah. the attempt uh, to, to, first of all, to distance themselves from the Confederacy in the South, uh, which I find ref on one hand, it's refreshing uh, to see that in West Virginia, particularly growing up here. And I see way too many people still brandishing uh, Confederate flags. And right. uh, so on one hand, that's refreshing. On the other hand, of course, they're really trying to um, whitewash uh, the racial hierarchy and the, yeah. and, and the slave system as it was. But, but it's really interesting that they try that. Uh, a lot. But my favorite reprint that you have in here is the uh, the children's book where they blow up the bulldozer. Uh, yeah, I thought that might be one of your... <laughs> Isn't that an incredible object? Yeah. Uh, what yeah. Chuck is talking about is that about half of the book is reprints of five different uh, publications that, that Appalachian Movement Press did, and, and they're like, they're straight facsimiles of the of the the publications themselves so that you can get a kind of feeling of having just picked up the actual object with the staple marks in it and everything and and so and so you liked the children's book i loved it uh well first of all you don't have very many children's books where the people blow something up so the, the, that's that's unusual for your standard children's book and isn't it the frog that comes up with the idea yeah there you yeah. go yeah yes yeah, this is this is a <laughs> Lazar and Boone or, or something. Yeah, Lazar and Boone stop strip mining bully to save Apple Valley and Buttermilk Creek, uh, a story for children and mature adults. Um, yeah, this book. I mean, I I found it first. A lot of the work that I was doing, I only had actually these lists of publications that they would print on the backs of their of their pamphlets. And so the pamphlets that were most available, you know, that I had found first had these lists of other things that ended up being really obscure. Lazar and Boone was one of the ones that I couldn't make heads or tails of it from from the title. And when I ended up in the at, at the WVU libraries, they had a copy of it and uh, and I was just blown away. So this is a children's story about um, you know basically uh, a small community that is facing strip mining and the strip mining is going to, to sort of destroy their way of life. And, and I think, you know, I, I go into a little bit about like what I, where the, these idyllic, the idyllic baseline for narratives like this, that I think is, yeah. is pretty common, but be that as it may, it, it's also a story about people attempting to redress grievances through official channels, failing, attempting even uh, the diplomacy of, in this case, having a conversation 
with a bulldozer, which the frog tries to do, <laughs> finds out that the bulldozer is not capable of having any conversations about the damage it's going to do. And so they get to sabotage. They get to sabotage after a lot of, of um, after a lot of struggle. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I found the people that wrote and illustrated it. Margaret Gregg was the oh, artist. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, Mike, uh, Mike Clark and, and, and I interviewed them and they actually both came from, um, you know, these, these particular strains of nonviolent um, Christian ideology where they were, you know, for them, they were writing this book about, you know, they were actually kind of both like, God, we really wish people didn't think it was a children's book about sabotage. Cause we were talking about the ecosystem and how, right, you know, right. what was at stake. Right. Which I don't think is lost, but I think, I could not pass up the possibility to take, there may have been 200 of these children's books ever printed. I really don't know and they don't remember. And so I had to, to bring that in. And yeah. WVU was really responsive to doing these reproductions and kind of bringing in that aspect of things. So, so now everybody gets to read Lazar and Boone. Yes, yes, <laughs> something for the kids. And, I think that... and the mature adults, yeah. Yeah, but not no one in between. Yeah, well, I, I don't qualify as either, I don't think, but uh, at this <laughs> point. So, yeah, great book. Uh, I hope people go out and, and, and get it and uh, look into that. And, and it's, a really, it, it's, it's really nicely designed, too. Uh, tons of illustrations. Uh, lo looks really good. So... Um, Thank you. So, Thanks to WVU. They did a great job with it. It was nice to not have to design something, right? Here's an example where I was just able to give them some stuff. I didn't have to yeah. do the design. It was wonderful to let go. What's the way, was, that, was that difficult? Or what you said was... Uh, uh, are there parts yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Sure, a little bit, but um, you can't always DIY everything. Right. You know, it was actually really nice to... and. Than Saffel, their designer, I actually just handed him all of my source material, all three binders of, of every Appalachian Movement Press publication I had, mm -hmm. and he just kind of was was with it, you know, just sort of lived with it in his office for several months, and so the, all of the design that he came up with was from, you know, really based on his own fascination with his interactions with that, you know, because he's a designer too and a, and a printer, so it was for him very close to the heart as well. Yeah, well, good. Well, Hope people get the book. Uh, congratulations on it. Uh, and obviously I'm going to be talking to you soon, I'm sure. Uh, sure. But do we have any uh, questions? Kenzie, are there any questions out there? Yes, we do. Karen Bryant. Karen Bryant, hey. <laughs> What's the big takeaway for you personally after having done all this great work with the museum? Not work related, but from a personal perspective. Coming in with the heavy ones already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the big takeaway, boy? Um, I might be still trying to figure that out. I've been working with the museum for six years, and I think the weight, uh, the, the psychic weight of, of some of the stories that we tell um, really, you know, really hits me sometimes. I'm not quite sure. I don't want to get too metaphysical in talking about it, but I think that... Um, you know, these stories for some of the people that we work with and some people on the board are passed through their own families. I mean, these are very, very, very like tight, you know, tightly woven into people's lives and, and mm. to be trusted to come in and listen and then, and then, you know, listen and kind of craft it with a group and then be given the, the, the possibility to just move forward and start designing in a physical mm. space with those stories in mind is, is really powerful. Uh, it's, yeah, it's incredible. I think I'm still figuring out the full answer to that, Karen, but I like that question a lot. Yeah, it, it's hard. It, it's hard. You're right. Um, <laughs> it, it, when you, uh, I, I, I even have, I haven't even really had time, even though I wrote about it, you know, and we write articles about it and do interviews about it. I still haven't really fully had time to reflect uh, on it because it's one task right after another. Mm -hmm. Done with one thing. Okay, there's a new journal issue. There's a new this to do. There's another event coming up, and it just keeps snowballing. And you don't. And sometimes you don't have time to just sit down and take a deep breath and go, hmm. Yeah, um, you got to find some time to reflect. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. There's a lot of work to be done still. Yeah. 
<laughs> Kenzie's like, I feel that so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I bet you do. I bet you do. Okay, what's Jackie say? That's my mom. I don't know, mom. <laughs> More wings. Chuck than... might be better, better equipped to answer that one. That, that boot that we were talking about. Who had the wingtips? Did everybody have nice shoes at that time? Some of the pictures people have. Yeah, you know, everybody has like a leather sole. Oxford on or something. A lot of the ones right. I've seen. Some of those work boots are looking like the kind of thing that are pretty hip right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They dressed better. Uh, they were definitely dressed uh, better dressed than I would have been if had I been charging up a towards a machine gun. I wouldn't have brought the good shoes. Uh, but I've, yeah, I've seen pictures of a coal miner with a pea coat on. Yeah, you know, it's like man, you know, yeah, it's a little bit different. Yeah, or if you're going to play mountain, you got to put on your 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 you know your Sunday best. And Why not? Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, might as well get dressed up. If you might get shot. Uh, that's a it's a good question. I know. Uh, Thanks, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mom. Okay, Janet. Oh, we're talking about Appalachian Movement Press stuff. Yeah, it's it's great to meet people who actually for whom Appalachian Movement Press was actually something that they lived with, because I think, um, oh, that's amazing. Um, that, uh, you know, for me, well, it can be intense and weird to be someone who did not experience the thing that I'm writing about, and then I'm cold calling people who are still alive and saying, can you tell me about this thing you did 40 years ago because I care about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's been really nice to meet people who are also in the movement who are like, yeah, you know, I read those things. I remember when those guys had a table at like every music show I went to, there were these really intense lefty guys selling pamphlets. Like that's cool. Somebody wrote a book about them. Okay. What else do we have here? Is that it? Okay. I saw a lot of comments, but I wasn't looking at them, but let's see. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah well, I, I don't see any more questions up there, and we're about an hour and 10, close to an hour and 10 minutes into it. Sean, thanks so much for chatting with me. Uh, you probably get tired of talking to me from time to time, uh, but I'm <laughs> glad we were able to no, do it. Chuck. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wait, we got one more. Hey, Bill. <laughs> Bill Yund is a fantastic, fantastic labor history illustrator right here in Pittsburgh. Um, yeah, Chuck, I mean, maybe, Chuck, you should probably take that one at least to start with. Just like, what is, what is it like? I feel like I hear a lot of people saying that they didn't read about this stuff in school. Mm -hmm. The people who were descended from people who fought in the battle sometimes did talk about it or just knew about it because someone wouldn't talk about it. I mean, what was your experience? Yeah, well, I mean, it, I had trouble getting my family to talk about it. And even after I found out about it, it wasn't my immediate family, but it was one of Frank Kinney's grandchildren that approached me and first talked to me about it. Uh, but one of his other gr grandchildren, like not my father or... or uh, it was one of the others, but yeah, um, I, uh, I have a big chapter on this where, where I talk about how it's systemat it was systematically taken out mm -hmm. and uh, of, of the history books and how it was systematically oppressed. So that's part of it. And one of the important things about the centennial right now, we're there, there's a lot in the media about what's being taught in history courses. I never thought in my lifetime there would be so much in mainstream media about history courses. Me in neither. High, in high school history. Uh, and so now, now it's suddenly the, the future of the nation is dependent on what we teach in history classes. Mm -hmm. uh, my high school, uh, aside from my West Virginia studies teacher, my high school history teacher was probably like a lot of other high school history teachers. Uh, he was uh, the football coach and the basketball coach. And well, like when we got to World War II, he put in sands of Iwo Jima and stood outside and smoked. That's, uh, but anyway, so, so first of all, they're not getting the best education always in some of these secondary schools. That's part of it. But also with this, contro you know, with this new controversy, particularly over uh, race, 
I have company here right now. And there are people mm -hmm. like crawling behind me to get to the bathroom. <laughs> uh, this is to avoid being on the screen. <laughs> Long story. Anyway, uh, we just got back from Chicago. Sorry, and I've got a whole big group here. They've been they've done great being really quiet though. Thanks, guys. Uh, uh, for an hour, yes. Uh, so anyway, the um, but my uh, my point is is right now a lot of the uh, discussion is on race as well. It should be, but it's it's also labor is another one of these things that we don't handle well in the classroom and that uh -huh. it's not really come into the, its significance uh, of the labor movement. And there are some obvious reasons for that, but yes, it does happen with Blair. Yeah, I think, and, and I'll just, I'll pull it back over to the exhibit side of things where we were talking when we first started. And, and, and hopefully if, if for people who haven't been to the museum yet, you'll see this towards the end of, of, the, of the, the story that we take you on we have a, a display case of, of sort of company propaganda and other mm -hmm. things that, that uh, publications that we have that uh, obscure what the story of the Battle of Blair Mountain was. And then we have shelves underneath that, that exhibit. So in the, in, the, in the exhibit case, you can pull these shelves out. And Chuck and I and, and, and Kenzie pulled together these books that, that the, the two of them mostly were familiar with from, from public school in West Virginia. And then we have them chronologically in each shelf open to the page that would have the mine wars listed uh, or talked about. And then you can see it progressively kind of trickle into the narrative, but they're definitely not whole books until you get to, um, I mean, the earliest full book if i'm not mistaken was bloodletting in appalachia is that correct or yeah yeah the yeah in the, in the 60s uh and you know the first textbook that they mentioned it was otis rice's book 1972 that had one paragraph about the battle of way uh, but uh, it doesn't really get any real treatment until the 21st century so we try to tell that in the exhibits in a way that like, why, you know, you gotta show some books and not like make people feel like you have to read them. So it is an interactive, you can open these drawers, but uh, yeah, I never would have thought that history classes would be on, uh, on the news either, you know, but yeah. I think that, I think that a lot of people are talking about teaching mythology and not necessarily talking about teaching history, right. to be honest. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. American Constitutional Association, they're coming back. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, there's a new Phil Con there's a new Phil Phil Conley book out there somewhere where yeah. I'm trying, to, trying to give us that. All right. Do we have any more questions or are we good to go? All right. Well, we want to thank the people that, 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 that listened and that tuned in. Of course, people can watch this online. Sean, thanks so much for all the work that you've done. Uh, Absolutely. Book and I'll be seeing you soon. You will. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll have another uh, episode for you in a couple of weeks. Until then, uh, guys, have a good one and take care. Good night, everybody. Good night.